This webinar provides illustrative information with respect to the subject matter covered and does not represent an official opinion or position of the Black Business and Professional Association. The BBPA makes no representations, warranties, or guarantees as to assume no responsibility for the content or application of the material contained herein, and especially this claim all liability for any damages arising out of the use or reference to or lines on such material. And it is a beautiful Saturday morning here morning. in Southern Ontario. Good morning to everybody joining us and morning. welcome. And um, just before we get started this morning, just wanted to um, put some notice on the, or bring some information and, and just general conversation about the Indigenous land claim. Um, I've, as everybody across Canada probably and, and across the world at this point in time um, probably knows is that um, our Indigenous brothers and sisters, um, their experience on their own land has not been an easy one. And um, as we say that Indigenous land claim, you know, it, it has to definitely mean more than just the words. And I encourage people um, to understand what is taking place because we have a lot of common denominators in our community as African people uh, who are also taken from our homes and separated from our parents and our loved ones for over 500 years in that experience that we had. So, um, you know, we are indigenous to our lands also. And um, it's <laughs> ironic that, um, you know, the indigenous pretty much all over the world have experienced um, similar um, or been subjected to similar experiences that have been adverse. So, um, you know, we, we also take notes and um, respect our, our Indigenous brothers and sisters here in Canada. And, and if I may add, a, a place to start is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, findings and their call to actions. Certainly one way to learn more about the history and experiences of Indigenous peoples uh, of this land and what they're calling on us collectively to do to reconcile uh, with our Indigenous communities um, across Turtle Island. Absolutely. And it has to be more than just talk. Obviously, there has to be a lot of action um, and that action speak definitely louder than words. And um, I, I think we can speak on behalf of people who've been subjected to adversity um, pretty well and confidently is that um, we, we need the action. We need now more than just the, the rhetoric and this, the, the continuous day in, day out, and we're gonna do something. We definitely need to see that action. And then as people who've been subjected to it, we also have to take our, our, our action into our own hands and, um, and heal and, um, and never let this happen again. So yeah, definitely so. No, thank you for reminding us. Um, uh, as uh, you know, uh, I don't know if a lot of folks celebrated Canada Day uh, this year, but uh, just two days from that, it's all. It's also good to remind ourselves that Canada Day means something very different from the Indigenous peoples of this land. Um, it, it's not a moment of of celebration for them. So always keeping that in mind. Well, uh, happy Saturday, though. <laughs> Absolutely. On that note, it's, it's warm, and we are here to learn. Uh, and I'm going to borrow Roderick's note. Tell a friend to to tell a friend. We're just starting, so folks can can join us here. Um, Absolutely. So have you been to yet? How's everything going with you? Um, I've been good. You know what? I got my first vaccination a week ago now. Okay. Uh, the pain has subsided, but I've I've ended up with this knot on my collarbone that I'm I'm trying to resolve. Okay, okay. Well, yeah. yeah, I know it's sort of a weird a weird knot thing going on, but I'm vaccinated. I'll wait a few more weeks to get that second shot and hopefully I can enjoy some summertime. Uh, with my my larger bubble. All right, absolutely. Happy to be here on a Saturday morning, of course. Mr. Pena, oh, he looks like he's done multitasking. Right yes, so, yes. Okay. So we've got some amazing uh, information that's going to come today on our program. And um, we can introduce Dr. Anna Setz. 
and um, you know, she, she comes with a wealth of experience. And did you want yes. to go through, uh, before we say hello to her, did you want to go through just a, a couple of her accolades? And, and yes, her- yes. Our, our guest today and for the next five weeks is Dr. Marcia Anisette, who is the Associate Dean Academic at the Schulich School of Business. And she's also a full professor of accounting. She holds a PhD in accounting from the University of Manchester and is a fellow certified chartered accountant of the UK. She's also a CPA of Canada. Her major research interest is in the social organization of the accountancy profession, an area in which some of her papers are considered accounting classics, having pioneered new research streams in the field. Dr. Anisette has also received a number of awards and honors for her scholarly work, including the 1999 Basil Yami Prize for the best article for the year, published in Accounting Business and Financial History Journal, the 2008 Outstanding Paper Award winner at the Literati Network Awards for papers published in Qualitative Research in Accounting and Management, and the highly commended awards in 2011 and 2016 for the Mary Parker Follett Manuscript Award for articles published in Accounting, Auditing, and Accountability Journal. She is also the Editor-in-Chief of Accounting Organizations and Society, an FT50 ranked academic journal, and sits on the editorial boards of 11 other academic accounting journals. She has previously held academic appointments at universities in England, the US, Spain, and her home country of Trinidad and Tobago. She actively participates in the organization of several important conferences in the fields of interdisciplinary accounting research and accounting history. So we are, are so very pleased to have Dr. Anisette with us today who promises to make accounting <laughs> very exciting oh. and fun uh, for us. Welcome, Professor. Thank you, Tiko. Uh, thanks for that uh, kind introduction. And, um, you know, thank you for doing this work. I am impressed at the number of individuals that I'm seeing on my screen who have come out at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning, one of the first few Saturdays that they are out of lockdown and that, you know, you chose to be here rather than doing something more exciting, particularly it's accounting. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, am, I am wholly impressed and I, I do hope I can make accounting a little more accessible. That's what, I'm, that's what my aim is, just to make accounting far more accessible than others have tried to make it out to be, so. Thank you. Oh, I, I love the Trinidadian accent, so I'm <laughs> all ears right now because it's uh, it says, sweet, sweet, sweet. The Trinidad sing song. People say Trinidadians talk as they'll be singing. So, <laughs> and we love it. We sweet love it. And you know, I always wanted to be a Whitney Houston. So, <laughs> <laughs> so just a couple house rules before we get you to share screen, um, Professor. Note that the session is being recorded and will be available on YouTube thereafter. So. Always go to the BBPA's YouTube page if you want to uh, see previous recordings or remind yourself of what we discussed in today's. Um, the chat is open and you can always raise your virtual hand. Um, and so we want the session to be you know, uh, an engaged and engaging. So please raise your hand if you have a question or a comment. And Roderick and I will facilitate uh, some of that with Professor Anisette. Otherwise, please do mute yourself. Um, If for privacy issues, you want to turn your cameras off, that's okay. But if you are going to raise a question, if you are going to ask a question, then we kindly ask that you turn your cameras back on just so we can see uh, who we're we're speaking to. Otherwise, um, Professor Anaset, over to you. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen now and uh, uh, Tika, you're going to let me know if I have succeeded. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. Right. And uh, let me see if I could get rid of, oh, maybe I need to do this. (laughs) Right. Um, So um, once again, um, everybody, uh, thanks for attending and and again, Thanks for, um, you know, Tika for that kind introduction. Um, You know, even though accounting 
you know, accounting is said to be the language of, of, of business. It's, it's, it's a discipline um, that was designed for business entities. It's a practical discipline. It's not a theoretical, you know, abstract, highly conceptual discipline. It, it really developed out of the practice of commercial, uh, um, you know, you know, commercial practitioners, individuals. They were men in those days. I was going to say men, and I'm like, this is so gender, but they were actually men. But so, the, you know, out of the practice of, you know, men who were involved in, in commerce. So, you know, unlike perhaps other sessions, um, I am not going to, you know, have a stream of consciousness and talking. Um, what I am hoping to do is through these sessions to help sharpen your financial literacy um, so that you know you can you can understand accounting as a language of business as it was designed for businesses, but at the same time look at the concepts, look at some of the tools and apply them to your own individual lives. Accounting was not designed for individuals, it was designed for businesses, but the principles um, and concepts can uh, be applied to our very individual lives in a way that can make us far more financially healthy, viable, and so on. Um, as I said, because accounting is a practical subject and certainly the way I, I, I teach it, it's, it's really to try to make it less remote, less abstract, and something far more accessible. And I find the way things become accessible to in individuals and relatable is if they could relate it to their own personal lives. So yes, while uh, I will aim to show you how you can look at a set of financial statements, let's say the financial statements of Air Canada, or the financial statements of Loblaws or Apple, or Amazon.com and make um, some fairly <clears throat> um, reasonable assessments about the financial health about those companies um, or the financial prospects of those companies. Why that is one of the aims, the second aim is that some of these principles we can also apply to our own um, financial health and our financial um, prospects. Um, this session, therefore, uh, which is the point I was trying to get at and never got at, um, is going to be very interactive. I'm, I'm not going to be talking for, you know, a continuous period of time and then, you know, have you ask questions. I will be asking questions probably on every slide and I hope you will be asking me, me questions too. Um, so, <clears throat> With that, um, let me just formally um, identify um, to you what are the objectives of the session. As I said, the objective is to develop, you know, financial literacy by helping you understand financial concepts, financial statements, and a bit of financial management. And I will do so by exploring three big topics, wealth, income, cash. Three things that we all want more of. I think we all know, we all have a sense of what these words are, and they are all things that, you know, we could all do with more of. So I want to sort of help clarify what they are, what they are not, how they are related, how one works with the other to create more. Um, so those are the three big topics. Um, that we'll be looking at over the next, uh, 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 today and the next uh, four sessions. Um, so first, I'm going to go straight into it. In fact, before I go into, into it, let me start a, 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 a bit of chatting. Um, maybe I can get a sense of, you know, what individuals here <clears throat> hope to achieve from, from, from these sessions and, you know, what are your dreams or your aspirations and how can financial literacy 
help you with your dreams and, and aspirations. So I'll just give probably 30 seconds just to see if there is anything in the chat that I may want to pick up on. Nothing so far. Nothing so far. <laughs> Um, good day. This is, um, Jeanne. Um, so for, for myself, I, I'm, I mean, with inflation, with everything always changing, um, mortgage rates and stuff like that, I personally would like to learn how to best navigate, um, through all the changes and, um, how best to position myself to, I guess, grow with those changes. Um, I'm a business owner and, um, I, that's like my full time for 11 years and co combining with like my husband's income as well. Sometimes I find it hard to, even though mortgage rates are like low to qualify based upon, um, proving the business income, you know, how much um, lenders will validate that income. So yeah, just to kind of how to maneuver with all the growing changes. That's really helpful, Gian. So do, have you had any formal training in accounting or is it just something that you kind of picked up along the way as a business owner? Um, so we have our accountant and I guess um, with my position in the business, I spent a lot of time on operations management um, with like where we run a, a vending company. Um, we're one of Ontario's top vending companies and providing vending machine services and helping other people start their vending business. So I didn't spend a lot of time with the accounting side. I am like... With, like sales and management of the accounts so I just quickly the money comes in quickly and then the management of it I, I can learn more with that instead of just kind of leaving it up to our accountants right right yeah okay so I there's mean, some of, sorry so and there are a few more in 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 the chat as well folks have been engaging there so um, from Clara, improve my understanding when dealing with my accountant, wealth building, how to manage cash flow from Aaliyah, building on personal financial literacy to maximize tax opportunities, um, financial literacy via Forex trading and other. So looking for insights and information. Beverly says starting a business and need to know best way to keep track of my finances. Also how to better manage uh, personal family finances. Um, Fedora would like to ask a question. You can go ahead, Fedora, and thank you, Gianna, uh, for your, your comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. So, um, Marcy, thank you so much for being here. I just recently joined the BBA, um, uh, and I'm just looking to try to just learn from you today and so forth. So, um, I'm currently studying accounting um, at the University of Windsor doing uh it with a minor in political science and when i got into accounting um it was a it was a different world and it was really it was it just changed my life and how i looked at things and then recently um i started getting to insurance to insurance and that in itself um completely I think we lost you for a bit there, Sador. Yeah, I think we uh, lost your signal there. Yes. A bit. Okay. But until he comes back, I mean, I'll, I'll just put in uh, literally my two cents. Haha, <laughs> it's accounting. Um, it's definitely one of the most important aspects of business. And, um, I, and I think what a lot of black businesses, and I'm generalizing in this, have difficulty in doing is, is keeping on top of their accounting just based on 
the um, the so many things that we've got to do as black businesses just to keep the doors open and whatnot. And um, from my experience and, and from hearing from other people, a lot of times the accounting goes to the wayside. And um, from what I've seen also is that um, a lot of black businesses um, have that large challenge of paying taxes and, and whatnot and sometimes even penalties just based on you know the accounting not being kept up to date so um, we encourage every one of you who is into business whether it be um, from the corporate or small business or even sole proprietorship um, aspect of things to stay on top of that accounting because it is it is critical for your business success Thanks. That's that's really helpful. I mean, w one of the things that <laughs> that yes, I'm hearing. Oh yes, she's back. Yes. You, the last I heard is that you said you got into insurance. You said accounting changed a lot of things for you, and then you got into insurance. That that was the last that I heard. Oh, I think he's gone again. Yeah, I think so. You must be having a little bit of okay. Difficult I mean, today. Yeah, one of one of the things that I, I realize is that we have, you know, some people with a fair degree of, you know, accounting knowledge. You know, I mean, I heard um, um, Gian, uh, Janine, is it Janine? I think uh, the first. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I heard her talk about you know income and, and revenues and so on. So that, you know, there are people who are really comfortable with the terms. Um, there may be some individuals who have absolutely no idea. So what I, what I intend to do, and it may be somewhat of a disappointment for those who are more sophisticated, is today really start from ground zero. You know, assuming that, you know, that there are some people here who are completely Innocent. Yes, everybody knows these words wealth, income, cash, because they are parts of our daily normal language and there are certain connotations that we understand. But I want to um, explore these terms or explain these terms as they relate to accounting. And we'll have to go, you know, very, very ground zero. So for those of you who are a little more sophisticated, just bear with us today because we all here to raise each other up and it requires some degree of generosity if you're further ahead, but that means you could also help me. You could also co-teach uh, the other participants. So I'm gonna move on um, now <clears throat> and go back to um, wealth. And as I said, you know, the objective, what I hope to get through um, over today and tomorrow is really talk about wealth. What is wealth? Um, uh, how do we um, measure it? Um, how do we represent um, wealth? What is personal wealth as opposed to business wealth, corporate wealth? How is wealth represented? Um, somebody spoke about building wealth. How can we build wealth? Um, importantly, because it's you know it's one of those words you say we want more of, and how can we actually destroy wealth? And and what are some of the things we need to be careful about in terms of our everyday lives, and also in terms of our business lives? Um, some of the actions that can destroy wealth. So that's, that's, that's wealth. And so let me start from, you know, the basics. Um, I'm, I'm just um, being challenged here with my screen. So give me um, two seconds. So what is wealth? Is it just cash? How many think wealth is just cash? I wish I could see the class. <laughs> um, I guess most of you have a gut instinct that wealth is not just cash. Um, and so the question is, if it's not just money, um, what else? If it's not just money, what else are some of the things that when you think of wealth, 
what you know what else is involved when that word comes to mind knowledge wisdom knowledge i Asset. like that assets somebody used the a, a, a word we need to talk about so when you say who said assets sankofa gian oh it was gian okay. when you say okay. assets what do you mean um valuable things that can bring money into um the the family or the business okay and any anybody else so we think of wealth in terms of money cash knowledge assets okay so i think we all have a sense that wealth is more than just cash it's more than just dollar bills or hundred dollar bills so let's talk about some of the things mentioned so when janine talks about assets she's talking about some of the other things other than cash um property your motor vehicle bullion <laughs> what else investments jewelry if we're talking about personal furniture what about clothes is clothes part of wealth i want to go back to jenny jenny you said oh, why am i why am i pronouncing your name incorrectly am it's i okay. in in the caribbean they spell it g i a n g a n if that would help ah! <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, Gian. That's okay. I will get it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Gian, yes, you know, uh, you said assets. We'll close because you gave a definition. It's closed assets. Are close if Depends. if it's if it's bringing in income, possibly. But well, you know the 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 the. the proper definition of wealth so or i should say the proper definition of an asset is or the theoretical definition um and i will bring it down to our individual lives and then we'll talk about it in the context of a corporation in your individual lives anything that brings you benefit is an asset um what you did do uh gian is um translate that notion of benefit into cash but cash need not be the only benefit you know behind me is my garden i i i i planted that it brings me joy i could say my garden is an asset because it you know i go out there you know when i'm stressed i weed i plant i pull out i move it brings me joy isn't going to bring me money <laughs> but it brings me joy so in a sense you know one can have you know a very expanded view of assets rodrick spoke about knowledge you know one can have knowledge about astronomy just because it piques your inter intellectual interest and it may not bring you money but it brings you that pursuit that hunger to know more and more about the solar system satisfying something internally in you so that you know we can have a very narrow view of assets right and 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 you know jian uh, has sort of jumped the gun a bit in terms of you know introducing the word assets right so wealth does involve assets and one of the things this conversation has indicated is that there are a variety of assets right assets take on different forms but if something brings the individual benefit and they own it of course because you know the sun gives me benefit but it's not my asset i don't own it right or but if something that you own brings you benefit it's considered an asset in a business sense the the theoretical definition 
of, of, of an asset is anything that is owned by the business that uh, can benefit the business. So both in a business sense and in an individual sense, um, the definition is basically the same. So that's one constituent part of wealth, assets. Assets, uh, in terms of calculating wealth, need to be measured. It's one thing saying, I have $1 million in the bank. I have a car. I have stocks and bonds. I have investments. I have furniture. How do I quantify that? So that one of the first steps in quantifying wealth is looking at the individual assets and assigning a monetary value to it. Do we see any problems with that? No, well said. One of the big problems with that is some of the assets. Think about what Roderick said. What about health? You know, Roderick said knowledge. Right, let's talk about uh, your, uh, you know, on an individual basis. What about health? Uh, is health an asset? Is good health? And, and you know, I'm, and, and what I'm doing, I'm moving from individual to company, right? But you will see why. Is is good health an asset? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just like knowledge, right? What's the difference between good health? and a property in terms of measuring assets. Without good health, you're not going to be enjoying anything in terms of any other assets. Right, right. that is very true. Sankofa. You, one can quantify a property. It's um, hard to quantify good health. How do you measure? Exactly. So that's one of the first limitations when we start talking about assets and wealth, there are certain elements of what is true wealth that cannot be measured. They cannot be quantified. There is no dollar value. And one of the problems of this discipline called accounting, it is a quantitative discipline. And there are some things that cannot be quantified. There is no way we can put a, a monetary value to them. And this is something, even when you start looking at company financial statements, that you have to keep in mind. Because company fi financial statements attempt to give you a profile of a company, but it can only give you a profile in a company that can be measured in monetary terms. That does not mean that certain things do not exist. They just cannot be quantified. So that always when we talk about things as they relate to accounting, you have to understand we are really looking through a very narrow lens of those things that can be quantified. So knowledge, I would say, is an asset. But if we were to produce our own individual balance sheets, we cannot quantify knowledge. We cannot quantify our good health. And as Roderick has said, in fact, the most important asset we may have may not appear in our balance sheet, which is good health. Right, And sometimes when you look at financial statements of companies, the most important asset they have may not be there because it cannot be quantified. So one of the things I always try to tell students, because we live in a world that is so dominated by the quantitative, we feel that, you know, the number says it all. The numbers are, by definition, limited. Numbers many times exclude some of the most important things of the phenomenon that we are interested in. And I think this issue, as Roderick mentioned about 
health being probably the asset that allows you best to enjoy all of your other assets. If it's not there, then, you know, what's the point? I think it brings home the point how some very, very crucial and important aspects of wealth, both personal as well as company, can be left out of the accounting calculus altogether. Any questions so far? But that's not just it. Wealth, when we talk about wealth, is not just what you have. And I'm bringing it down in, in lay women's terms, right? Wealth is not just what you have. There's one other thing that is missing, and that's huge. And I'll give you an example. I might tell you, you know, that house there is mine. That car, maybe it's a Lamborghini. I don't know. I don't know cars, but it, it looks fancy enough. That fancy car, mine. You're like, wow, they pay up professors a lot, <laughs> right? What am I not telling you? If you own it. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's like Donald Trump, right? Flashy, lots of stuff. But there's a whole other universe that we don't know. So the complete understanding or full understanding or the full capture of wealth is that you have to minus what is called liabilities or debt. So wealth is the total value of that word Gian used, assets minus the total value of liabilities. And that is when we talk about individuals' wealth, that's what we are talking about. We can't just look at the asset side. We can't just look at what they have. We also have to look at, well, what do they owe? Because what they have may be encumbered by debt. So <clears throat> there's a thing about liabilities that is very much different, uh, very much similar to assets, in that we have already established that you can have different types of assets. We have established that different types of assets give you different types of benefits. So that the different types of assets can have the potential to generate more assets than others. So as Gian, or I can't remember who is, yeah, clothes, you, you have nice clothes, you feel good, but that's about it <laughs> as far as the clothes, you know, it makes you feel good, which in itself is, you know, is a good thing. I mean, it's good to feel good, but that's about it as opposed to if you had a rental property. So I may have $100,000 worth of clothes in my, 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 my closet that make me feel good. I change it every day. I look lovely. I feel good. I feel confident. Somebody else may have $100,000 of assets, but it's a rental property. Whose assets have the greater potential? the rental property. So assets, I now flip back to assets. It's a point I wanted to make. Assets have different capacities to generate more assets, more wealth. Similarly, liabilities themselves can be different and they have different capacities to be problematic. I think everybody knows and when I use the word liabilities, this is an accounting term. Liabilities is the same as debt. We all know what debt is, D-E-B-T, right? Liabilities is what you owe. And what you owe is something very easy to quantify, okay? Unlike some assets, you kind of always know what you owe. 
The different types of liabilities though, some are more problematic than others. So what are some liabilities? Or um, what kinds of debt is there that we know of? A loan. A loan? From whom? Hmm. There could be a bank loan. That's Cred a loan. Credit card debt is a tough one. Credit card debt. But I, I, I but, but hold on, Santafel. I, I want you to hold because that's an important one. Somebody said loan. But loan itself can be categorized. It could be a bank loan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It could be a loan from your parents. Right? It could be loans from friends. Right? Those are still loans. What's the difference between a bank loan and a loan from your parents or, and family? That the bank loan has lower interest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your family is evil. <laughs> The bank loan has lower interest than loans from your parents and yeah, friends. <laughs> comic relief. It depends on your parents and friends. But generally, you know, generally, you know, if 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 you if if your parents or friends had the capacity to lend you money, you would probably, you know, because you think it would be less formal, less um, um less, how should I say? Um, they, they will have more mercy on you. Uh, and, and more um, grace um, shown towards you than if it were bank. So even though they are loans, right? If you had a choice to be owing the bank $100,000 or owing your family $100,000, I think most people would say, I prefer to owe my family the $100,000 because you know that would be less stressful, right? So. That's just in the category of loans. And there are all kinds of loans, right? Second type of debt is what uh, Sankofa spoke of. Over to you. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> you know, that debt could be a, a detrimental debt, just the level of the interest that goes with credit it. Credit card. And then also it takes you to the, the credit people, you know, when you don't pay it. It affects you deeply. Right. So there's bank loans. There's loans from friends and families. There is credit card debt. There are, there's a mortgage. And each of these loans is different. And each of them comes with them different types of risk. And that's the problem of loans. Loans have two problems. One mentioned by Sankofa is that they have a cost, right? <laughs> Unless, you know, I mean, Let's say like your mother, right? people borrow money and, you know, sometimes they don't pay back and, you know, you lend them $20, they give you back 18, <laughs> 10 years down the line, right? That's, a, that's, that's a, you know, if, if you're the borrower, that is an interest-free loan, <laughs> right? But most formal loans have interest, meaning you borrow $100, is it from the bank? Is it from the credit card company? You borrow $100, you have to pay back $100 plus. And that plus is called the interest rate. That's the cost of borrowing money, right? So loans are costly. Loans are also risky. Some loans. And this is the difference, and this is an important distinction brought up when Sankofa mentioned credit card debt. And I'm going to talk about two types of loans. Everybody knows what a mortgage is? Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah many people know. I'm seeing Kara smiling. Yeah, we all know what a mortgage is, right? 
and we all know what credit card debt is. What's the difference between the two? Right now, the difference between the two is about 18%. <laughs> right? You know, a mortgage, the interest, the cost of borrowing money, if it's through a mortgage, it's probably 1.25%. The cost of borrowing money through credit cards is about 19%. Why is it so different? Why when you use your credit card and don't pay it, you pay interest of almost 20%. Why is that? Um, one, one is backed by one is backed by an asset. So when you do your when you buy a home, you, you don't pay your mortgage, they can take your home. And then the credit card, you know, it's not really I'm backed secure. by right. So if we look at it from the standpoint of the lender, not us, the borrower, the bank or the mortgage company protects themselves in the event that you don't pay by creating what is called a lien on the asset or charge on the asset, which is a legal document which says, well, if Marcia does not pay this mortgage on time, I could go and take the asset from him. I could go take the property. I have the first charge. I can take this property, sell it, and pay back myself. So from the standpoint of the lender, the risk is fairly low because I can lend you money and I have a legal document that says, if you don't pay me back, I can move, take the house, sell it, whatever is owed to me, pay myself back, and if there's any left, give you. So that, that is why mortgages, the interest of a mortgage is low. Because the risk to the lender is low. Of course, you, the borrower, the risk to you, the borrower, is high, right? And there's a trade-off, right? Because you're paying low interest, but your risk is high. The risk is that you lose your asset. On the other hand, it works the opposite way with credit cards. Credit cards are called unsecured debt. You go, you buy clothes, you buy whatever, you're choking it up. But the credit card company has nothing, you know. All they have is that telephone and a mean person calling you and hunting you down. That's all they have. And you know what? You could not answer the telephone. <laughs> they don't have any protection. And therefore, from the standpoint of the credit card company, their risk is high. Right? Mm -hmm. Their risk is high and they compensate for that high risk by charging you high interest. So we have to look at it from the standpoint of the lender. But also we are now, since we are talking about wealth, looking at it from the standpoint of the borrower, us, that when we talk about wealth, right, there are two components of wealth, right? One is the total assets, and we have to minus from the total assets, the total liabilities. But the big complicating factors are two people quantitatively can have the same wealth, can have the same number in terms of total assets and have the same number in total liabilities, but their profiles and their prospects may be completely different because one person's liabilities or debt, maybe all credit card debt, right? Which is high cost, but low in terms of claim on the assets. Another may be the reverse, 
mortgage, claim on the assets, low cost, but then they may have a huge asset, a house that has a high value. So these are just some of the complicating factors. I just want to end here on this long discussion on wealth. Wealth is a term that we all know. When we talk about wealth in a personal, about, about individuals, the term that is used is called net worth. So don't get confused. Wealth and net worth really are exactly the same thing, right? Total assets minus total liabilities. And the term net worth is used generally for individuals. So let's look at some, is that a question, sorry? No, I was just gonna say, um, very well said, like it was it definitely brought me back to the basics, but it really helps me um, re be, re re uh, remember the most important things when building wealth is found in the basics. Um, so thank you for that. And I, I just also wanted to add liabilities um, can be a good thing if it's generating um, um, opportunity to bring in, or like you said, the benefit, if it can benefit um, on building wealth. Absolutely. And that's really in the next session, you know, we all think because liabilities comes with a minus, we all think, oh my goodness, I am going to try to reduce my liabilities. I am just going to make liabilities zero. But liabilities need not be a bad thing. In fact, liabilities are not a bad thing because liabilities, if used well, Debt, if used well, can generate wealth, <laughs> right? Assets used badly <laughs> can destroy wealth. So, it, you know, it's not a matter of one or the other. It's how you use debt and it's how you use your assets. So when I get into next week and talking about building wealth, wealth but already the foundation is there because you already see that there are different kinds of assets that have more potential to generate more assets and there are different kinds of liabilities that have more potential to eat up your assets right and it's a matter of how do you marry the two and how do you leverage the two to build more wealth. So that's in the next session. So thank you so much for that, Gian. So, you know, we have, uh, I can't believe the time has gone so quickly, um, but you're a good group. So <clears throat> we have some, uh, some high net worth individuals and you can Google, right? Now, when you want to know how wealthy individuals are, the question that you will ask Google would be, what is Oprah's net worth? Or what, not, what, not, not what is the value of Oprah's assets? You want to know her, her net worth. You want to know what is the assets left? Effectively, if you think of net worth as how much would you have left after you pay off what you owe, right? Everybody gets that concept, right? So. We have one, two, three, four, five. We have five individuals who we think is uh, the lowest net worth of these. <laughs> okay, let's start from the top. Who is the highest net worth? I would say Oprah. 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 Okay. So or, or Michael or Michael Jordan. Okay, let's see. The lowest, Obama. Oprah uh, is clear <laughs> above Michael Jordan. Mm. I mean, it's $2.7 billion. Not um, assets, net worth. Her assets could be $8 billion, right? And we have to take from those assets minus 
claims on those assets, which bring it down to 2.7. So Michael Jordan is, is, is whoever said Michael Jordan is a close second. Yeah, Michael Jordan is second. Somebody said Obama is, 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 is the last. Um, yeah, so um, mm -hmm. Will Smith is 350. Um, Million. And who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Professor Anisette, um, what's interesting, so high net worth individuals, and you've clearly showed folks who earn a lot of money. Yeah. I, but I think there's also a point to be made that there are people who don't earn a lot of money that still have high net worth um, just because of how they spend their money. So if you could maybe talk about that a little bit, because I think sometimes us folks just aspiring to be middle class, if there's such a thing, still forget that, you know, two people earning 60K a year can actually have a larger net worth than people earning high six figures. Absolutely. Absolutely. So again, what Tika has spoken about is... <laughs> you know, when we go into income and managing income and using income to build wealth, right? So right now, what I want to talk about is wealth. That's talk, things that we have, right? And I think the important point I want to leave here with today is because we can go around in circles. So I will get to that side of the circle, Chika. <laughs> but not today. I, you know, I want us to go very slowly so that there are a couple of key points here. If you have, if, if tomorrow you inherit $1 million, that's an asset. Keeping that $1 million under your mattress Six months from now, you will have a million dollars. A year from now, you will have a million dollars. So cash as an asset is only good because of its potential for you to acquire income generating assets. By itself, cash is useless. And you could look at some financial statements of companies and say, that company has too much cash. Too much cash can be a bad thing. I'm seeing Sankofa with a question. Yeah, and it's going back to your, um, your, uh, your accounting business. Uh, since you and Michael Kinnick are the accountants of accountants, you you have systems of accounting that can, you know, sometimes we have to ask the question, how do we come to a person's asset and what forms do we use to, to say what the liability is? Because that in itself is also a way for people to, their wealth could go higher, their network could go higher, depending on the systems. And I know you might not want to talk about that now, but the systems we use to determine how to, our asset, you know, like a car, what system are we using to determine the value of a car when the you buy it? The measurement, yep. Yeah. And Absolutely. Then I wanted to put another thing when you were talking about clothes. I was going to put a little nuance in there that certain basketball shoes, if I had bought them years ago, I would have lots of money now. Just, just so we put a look at new ones in there. So some clothes appreciate in value. But you the, didn't buy it to wear it. <laughs> you didn't buy that shoe to wear it, right? You no. bought that shoe as a collector's item. So it's yeah. less of a shoe, right? It's an investment, right? So I think what I'm going to do is just end here today um, because I'm seeing the time and there are so many exciting questions you're asking, and I don't want to believe us. So let me just go through a number of points raised by Sankofa, Tika, 
uh, Jian and others. Wealth, net worth, right? The assets that you have matter. The types of assets that you have matter. Some assets, and this may be, although this may, this may actually be the point, part of the point that Tika is making. So let me go back to the point I was making. You have $100,000 or $1 million under your bed. You sleep every day. You will wake up tomorrow morning. You will wake up 10 years from now. Let's say you go into a coma. Your assets are $1 million. You could take that same $1 million and invest it. Let's say you are in the Toronto property market, right? And you invest half of that million dollars, $500,000 in a house and you go to sleep, you fall into a coma, you do nothing. By doing nothing, you will wake up three, four years later and your wealth would have increased because the value of the property has increased. It has, it, has, it has witnessed what is called a capital gain. Everybody's with me there? So there's a difference between cash, and the point I was trying to make there is, cash is called an idle asset. It does nothing, <laughs> right? Even if you take that cash and deposit it in the bank, in a bank savings account, how do banks make money? Banks take your money, pay you 3% for your money, right? Mm -hmm. And lend out your money at 10%. <laughs> That's how banks make money, right? So if you can take that $1 million and invest it somewhere and earn 7%, it makes no sense even putting it in the bank at 3%, right? You know, having the money, now it's good to have money, some money in the bank for a rainy day. But there is also, just like for some companies, you can look at companies' financial statements and say, they have too much cash. They should be using their cash. And, and, and you know, let's throw it out there. You have a million dollars cash. What are some of the choices to do with that million dollars cash? Invest in a high income earning asset or appreciating asset. You can invest in a house. You could invest in stocks. So you can use the cash to buy more, you know, more promising assets. What else can we do with the cash? Invest we pay off problematic liabilities, right? We can't be, we, 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 we might have credit card debt <laughs> at 20%. It's better to take that cash and pay off the 19% of the 20% credit card debt, right? Because the cash by itself doesn't tell us our net worth. Right, we have to look at the liabilities, right? In fact, it may not even make sense to take the cash to pay off the mortgage if the mortgage is 1.2% interest, right? Because if the mortgage rate is 1.2% interest and you could take that cash and even deposit it in a fixed deposit for 3%, keep the mortgage. <laughs> Right, because you're only paying 1.2% interest, but you're earning 2.5% on the um, on the fixed deposit. So these, this is how you know. So so you know, on 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 the on the one hand, to take us point, you can do nothing. You can go into a coma, and your wealth can increase 
if your wealth is invested in assets whose value just appreciates, appreciates. as time goes by. And there are some assets that are like that. But there are some assets from the day you buy them, their values depreciate. And that's a car. <laughs> you know, a car is an asset that the day you drive that car out of the dealership, its value declines, unlike a house. So if you had a choice between two, if you can't have both, right? Now, this is not to say a car is not a good asset to have because it gives you mobility. It gives you more than a house, perhaps the option to, you know, to do, to do other things, to earn income, to go to job. But it's an asset you have to be very clear about that it's an asset whose value declines. Whereas a house is an asset whose value typically appreciates. And therefore, when you are looking at what is called your portfolio of assets, right? When we are talking about, you know, that total asset figure, it needs to be made up of a portfolio of assets that kind of complement each other. You need to have some assets which you don't have to do anything. They're working on their own and they're building wealth. Right, but all of your assets cannot be assets that, you know, as time passes, their value goes down. There are some assets that just the passage of time makes a difference in their value. And I think this is something that Sankofa was trying to get at in terms of, you know, the measuring of assets. There's a, a temporal aspect of it, how time works on the value of assets. Um, I am over time, am I, Chika? <laughs> uh, we can probably, so we have 20 minutes left. Um, I know yeah. Sidor had a, a couple questions and their, their tech issues are resolved. So maybe we can give Sador a first go at asking their question. And then if others have questions, please post in the chat or, or raise your virtual hand. Sharing now because I will I will end sure, the yes, presentation for today and because I want to to see people I'm not seeing anybody. Great, thank you, Sador. If you're still there, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. perfect. I, I won't take too much time, but I just want to say thank you, okay. so for being here. Um, but my main question just deals with insurance. Um, currently, I'm studying accounting at the University of Windsor, and I'm working on getting my insurance license. And insurance just opened up a whole new world to me. And just in terms of just um, leverage and capital borrowing and all that, I'm just wondering if you could uh, explain perhaps from your experience and work in the financial service services, um, how can insurance be beneficial um, in helping you sort of become your own bank rather than borrowing from all these uh, private lenders who are taking your money and making more interest than giving you interest? I was wondering if you can just speak on that. Um, that's, that's a highly packed question. Um, one is, um, so, so let me unpack it because I think there are two things that we need to clear up. What's the difference between accounting and finance, right? Now, finance and their finance professionals who can tell you how to invest your money, where to invest your money, you know, uh, financial management and so on. Some accountants can do that, but that's a different area of expertise. Um, what accounting is about is really preparing and presenting statements that help people understand what is the financial health, strengths, prospects of companies. Right, so they're really two different areas of expertise. Um, now, in terms of insurance, <laughs> in terms of insurance as a business, um, you know, insurance helps because insurance protects against 
the rainy day. Um, I believe personally, and this is my own personal belief, there is a thing about being overinsured because also insurance is a business, right? And insurance companies, therefore, have an incentive to have people overinsured, right? You know, overly protecting themselves for the rainy day, which may never come, right? And that's how it works that, you know, we want, you know, a hundred people to be insured for that rainy day, but we hope the rainy day never comes to the hundred people and, and we get to keep their money. So in terms of, you know, in terms of, and I'm not sure if I'm answering your question because I'm not sure exactly, um, you know, I'm not sure exactly how the insurance comes in. So if you ask me again, uh, Tadra, I, 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 some of the other, I feel I've lost the question. So, uh, you know, pardon me. Yeah, no, I'll just, um, I'll just mention real quick. So um, I'm telling you, uh, um, uh, I just said I'm, I'm working on getting my insurance license and I discovered this thing where um, you can get a life insurance premium, let's say you put $1,000 into it every month. Um, what you do is you take your um, savings that you have in your bank, uh, put it into this life insurance premium. So there's interest growing at it and it becomes sort of a cash value and you can use it as collateral. Then you can borrow against that life insurance in which let's say you have a policy of three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars that would be given to your family once you die. You can borrow that money right now, but based on terms and conditions and criteria. So therefore, you don't need the bank anymore. You can become your own bank. Um, that's what I was sort of trying to... Um, oh, you mean, oh, right. Become your own bank. bank. Yes, through insurance. insurance. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, you know, you can, you can become your own bank through savings. I mean... You know, effectively what you're talking about is using insurance as a vehicle for savings, right? Because what the insurance company is doing, and this is their expertise, right? But you could do it on your own, right? It's just that they have the expertise to do it. They're saying, okay, take your $1,000 every month, give it to us, right? So we're going to have this as an insurance policy, right? If you die, but please don't die. If you die, this is an insurance, you know, policy that on death we would pay. You could use, they take that money, they invest it in high yielding securities and hoping that they continue to be high yielding so that if you ever come back, if you ever perish, right um and they have to um pay out they would have invested your money but that is not you know so insurance is really acting as an intermediary for, for an individual who could do exactly the same thing right they could take that money it's just that there is not the cover of that protection that if if i perish early that my family is covered. So yes, that is, you know, that is a way of, you know, killing two birds with one stone. John. Sorry. John. Just a reminder that people need to mute themselves. Right. <laughs> Professor. So, so, I, so, so yes. So, um, if I just yes. add one thing, um, I think the difference between um, sort of being your own bank um, through personal investments compared to being your own bank through insurance is the amount of capital that you can raise. Um, and I think like a lot of black businesses are having problems just getting loans mm -hmm. from lenders. Uh, but with leveraging off insurance, you won't need the bank if you're borrowing against your life insurance premiums. You can just get that two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 based on the criteria in terms of conditions. So yeah, I just want to ask that. Yeah, thank you. I, 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 I think you know, one of, and I think you, 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 you make a good point because what that, remember that life insurance isn't there in a vacuum, right? You have to be paying that premium. So a lender, let's say a third party lender, 
is seeing that this person has the capacity to save this money. Because in a sense, the insurance is treating that both as a, a, a savings vehicle for you and a protection vehicle for you. And one of the problems that you talk about, the, the underlying issue is savings, right? And I think this is where Tika's point comes back where we come back to Tika's point, which is, you know, part and parcel of wealth destruction or wealth building is your ability to live within your means. And that is where savings comes in. Knowing that my, what is coming in, and these are terms <laughs> you would look at later on, that my, you know, my lifestyle isn't in excess of uh, what my pocket can bear. So underpinning all of wealth building too is the ability to save and saving requires discipline because saving says, I have for every dollar you save, it's what is called deferred gratification. It's like, I could spend this now but I am going to defer that spending for later. So savings, it shows discipline. It shows financial discipline, but it also acts as a cushion for that rainy day. And anybody sort of trying to assess a person's credit worthiness would look at their capacity to save. Um, so I hope that sort of ties in a lot of, <laughs> yeah, you know, see, a lot of things we, that were coming up. Huh? I think we have a follow-up question from Mona. Mona, your hand was raised if you want to ask your question. Yes, good morning. Hi, Mona. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I wonder about the, the risk of that borrowing from that insurance without um, real sound legal uh, questioning, because there can be so many issues raised within that scenario that I think for the layman, you may not be able to, um, to really appreciate so many things before taking that plunge. Is that correct? I agree. <laughs> I agree, but... Um... <laughs> I agree. I mean, there, there's so much fine print in some of these products that, uh, and you know, at the end of the day, um, we always have to realize that these businesses are in business, <laughs> right? You know, I remember once, and I'll give you, I'll give you another example. I remember once. Uh, you know, going into the bank and, you know, I am a very conservative, financially conservative person. And, you know, I had, you know, some, some money in, in the account and, you know, what the banker was telling me, well, why don't you put this in a fixed deposit and then borrow the same amount? And I'm like, but you think I'm stupid? But he, you know, he was seriously selling me this product. You know, put it on a fixed deposit and then borrow it. And I'm like, why would I put this on a fixed deposit for three, you know, 3.2% and then borrow the same money from you at 8%, right? They are in the business of making business of take, you know, any, any, any business that takes your money, right? Is profiting from that right? They're taking your money. That's the business model, or else they would not be in business at all, right? Taking your money for free. That's what the insurance thing that Taco is talking about. Taking your money for free, giving you a promise that if something happens to you, right? And they wouldn't give it to someone who it's looking like something is going to happen to them next week, right? They wouldn't give me that if I have COVID, <laughs> right? Young, robust, 
healthy, right? Take your money, invest it in some high income thing. And yes, I don't, you know, I, I may not have the financial prowess to know, you know, investing it in these portfolio, but it's something that you can do. Invest it, right? Make money off your money. And then tell you, well, you could borrow on your money. <laughs> and it's not going to be interest-free. You're not borrowing on your money interest-free. So, in, in, you, know, you know, to Mona's point, in all of that, it may look good. It may sound good, right? The, the add-on, though, you know, and I, I don't want to be... Um, Unfair here, the add-on to that, what Sadur is talking about, is that you get something with that, which is the protection, that in the event that you perish before, you know, there's the protection that your family, <laughs> because if you're dead, it's not going to help you, right? But um, that, that, that there's that insurance coverage. But that's, that's kind of a tricky way of selling insurance in my mind right because you you kind of you you kind of paying double but i you know i kind of you know don't want to comment too much on that and say but you know a lot of the devil is in the details there and i you know those kind of things that song anything that sounds too good i would give it a pause because nobody is <laughs> is in yes. the business to, <laughs> to, make to not make money Exactly, to make you rich and to make themselves poor. <laughs> yes, yes, so the, the, the pay attention to the details. I, I, yeah. I think the, the short uh, thing to take. Uh, Gian has their hand up, and I just want to note that we have five minutes left. So um, if we could also be brief in the question asking and brief in the response, just so we can get everyone out on time. So Gian, please. Think before that, how, how do I put my hand up? Because I don't seem to have. You had it up a second ago, Michael. Okay. Just um, now. Okay, yeah, so I'm in so the queue. Okay. We'll call on you after uh, as, as our last question. So Gian, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just, I'm happy that I got the link to actually tune in today because just hearing from the professor and everyone sharing, this is very good. Um, so for the sake of time, I just wanted to um, add on to the comments that were just made regarding insurance. I too am looking into um, life insurance and really had to look through the policy and the details. However, I feel that um, referencing Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad Poor Dad says a good deal work is one that works for the, the two parties, whether it be the buyer and the seller, the investor, the lender, uh, sorry, the borrower, or the lender. If we can, because there's a, there's, there are things that we um, should respect about business. You know, the insurance companies, yes, we've heard the negatives about rob robbery. However, if it works for you and that is the deal for you and you can create wealth and build wealth with that and it works, I think it's something to consider um, and not to kind of be afraid to look at companies just as... Um, they're going to make money on your money because yes, they're in business for that. But what if it brings you more and builds that wealth and opens that opportunity for generational building of wealth? So um, yeah, if I, I'm just going to add like a link in the chat room um, for a good um, link that actually have great policies for insurance. Thank you so much for that. I think Gian, you, you, you made a good point. And, you know, we will talk about a, another concept later called opportunity cost, because the point is, yes, they are in the business to make money on your money. But if you can't make more money on that money, if your only other option is to keep that money under your mattress, or, you know, if the only um, option available to you is to put the money in a bank account and, and earn 3%, it's still better than having it in the, under the mattress, right? So you, you're quite right. I mean, a good deal is, you know, a deal where if there is 10% profit to be made between, you know, on your money and the bank earns 
8% and you earn 2% and you have no other option, you don't have the skills or the time or the prowess, you might as well make the 2%. So I, I fully agree with that. Um, I think somebody else had a question. Yes, it was Michael. Michael is going oh, to- Oh, Michael. Yeah. Michael, you're not gonna be asking me questions. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's going to wrap us up. That. Oh. <laughs> you're, you're right, Doc. I, I shall not ask a question. I, first of all, it's nice to see thanks for coming on board and to see to the folks I'm actually doing two Zooms as I speak. I'm doing some work for the Chartered Professional Accountants of Canada on one side and I'm listening on the Zoom. And I just like to see the folks. Some people may think accounting is boring, but not when Dr. Marsha is making the presentation. You can see that accounting is really our lifeblood. And one of the things, you know, just piggybacking on the question the chairman lady posed just now, one of the emphasis we have in the BBP is to give people the tools so they can take decisions on their own. Not to shove anything down anyone through, but to see here are the options you face. And if you're knowledgeable, you should be able to take that decision that suits you or your family rather than someone just come like the example you gave there's a popular example folks are telling people to take their money off their savings and invest it into other instruments and they're not telling them they even mention some tax implication that you can get some tax credits but they're not telling them that between the low interest rate that they're getting and the tax credits that they're paying out they're still behind the eight ball because the interest that they're paying is still higher than the tax credit or the interest they're earning. But sessions like these, doctor, is designed to give people the tools so they can make the kind of analysis that you just mentioned. And I just want to say on behalf of the BBP, thanks for being on board and I know you'll be with us for the next four weeks in a row and hopefully at the end of that exercise we'll be closer to being doctors than where we are now <laughs> okay thank you thank you thank you everybody and i learned a lot from you guys too so that's what i love about this it's it's just really been a community effort and you know everybody's sharing and lifting each other's boats so thank you and see you next week so on that note before we say uh or au revoir for another week. I just wanted people here with us today to recognize what black excellence looks like, what black intelligentsia looks like. Um, obviously here with uh, Dr. Anaset, and in terms of this is what we have to put in our minds that we are of greatness, right? That we have people from our communities that can lead and, and show us and, and teach us. And as we always say, just don't keep it to yourself, whatever you're learning, share it with your community, reverberate it. So again, our knowledge, our wealth in terms of that transference of, of, of information can grow within our community. And as we know, um, the more that we tell each other and, and show each other, the bigger capacity that we have in our own community. So thank you very much. Just wanted to say that uh, on behalf of the BBPA. And also before we leave today, uh, if you know any young people who are going into post-secondary education or any aspect of training, please, please, please encourage them to apply for the BBPA scholarship. Um, Michael, I, I, actually, I think he's uh, double tasking there. But last year we gave over um, I believe 150 scholarships um, totaling over $300,000 um, on behalf of the BBPA to, um, to students entering post-secondary school. And uh, this year, I'm sure we will uh, be doing even more so. So uh, by all means, tell uh, your young people within our community to apply for the scholarship. The deadline is July the 10th. So Which is a week, a week yeah. from today. So please get on that. So as I say, don't wait, debate, or procrastinate. You know, obviously after the 10th, it's too late. So jump on it right now. You got to be in it to win it. All right. And on great. that note. Thank you. Have a great week, everyone. See you safe. Safe. Saturday. Absolutely. See you. Take care, everybody. Bye.